but actually it's an opportunity to discuss the Islam's take and Islam's philosophy on death, on life and death, and how we view it, how we're supposed to think about that, not just philosophically and theologically, but what impact is that supposed to have on my day-to-day -day life? Like, death is a reality, but how much of that plays a role in the way that I live my life and my emotions, my, you know, how I regulate myself on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me just first begin with uh, this ayah's translation, and then inshallah we'll get into the work. Qul, tell them. When you see Qul in the Quran, it's the Prophet ﷺ being told to speak to somebody directly. So the Prophet ﷺ is being commanded to address this community. So Allah is now, the, the lessons so far were to the Muslims, but now there's a quick switch, and now temporarily, go talk to them also. So the secondary audience became the primary audience temporarily. Okay? They became the primary audience. And then, right after that, they're going to become the secondary audience again, and the primary audience will once again be the Muslims, Ya Ayyuhad Nadina Amanu is coming, in ayah number 9. This is an important uh, piece of information because this tells us that the Qur'an was speaking to multiple audiences at the same time, right? And when it's speaking to multiple audiences, like I'm talking to you, but they can hear me, right? Or I'm talking to them and they can hear me. And then sometimes I switch over and talk to them directly while they can also hear. Kind of like, you know, a parent when they're yelling at one child and the other kids are enjoying it. And then they turn to the other one and they're like, your turn. You know, they switch to the other side. So, but it, it, there is this kind of intifad. It's called intifad, switching from one audience to another audience. And this is something that happens in the Quran very strategically. And this is Allah's way of showing us that in the in Medina, when the Quran was being recited and when it was being declared and publicly shared, that it wasn't just the Muslims that were listening and engaging with the Quran. It was also actually the Jewish and Christian communities that were engaging with the Qur'an. And the Qur'an was actually telling the Prophet ﷺ to engage them directly in dialogue. It was actually directly engaging. It's not just talking about them, it's talking to them. It's talking to them. And the, and the Prophet is being instructed directly to engage with them. Which is really interesting because there was a mentality that the scholars, like they're, they're people of knowledge, and they saw the, the rest of the Arabs as these uneducated people who don't know how to read and write. Right, so how can someone who's uneducated officially be debating with someone who is very well educated in their literature? Right, this this it's like it's like somebody who didn't even graduate from school debating with someone who has a PhD. Right, and the the the, the scholarship of the Jewish community, the Israelites, their scholarship is actually called Afbar in the Quran. Afbar actually comes from the word Hibr, which means ink, and because they wrote so much. And because they read the, you know, the, the leather that they stretched and they wrote on, they, they read that so much and they put their finger on it so much, their, their hands would always have ink on them. Smudged from the, the reading and the writing they did all the time. And so they just got called people of ink. Because they're doing all this reading and writing all the time. Uh, I had uh, the good fortune of making friends with a couple of rabbis. And, you know, I, I hang out with them. Uh, they shall not be named because they would rather remain anonymous. Right, which is cool, I get it. So, but when I talk to them, I am so impressed with the level of study that they do. Like, it's unbelievable how much study they do. I mean, one of the friends I know, he, he studied uh, 14 years in their madrasa, like their religious school, 14 years, and then went in, uh, to university and did a PhD, you know, another eight years, and then after that, he still now studies an average of 10 hours a day. This is an average of 10 hours. A day. Like the amount that they study is staggering. It's actually so impressive, <laughs> you know? And this is their history. Their history is that of volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of books. These are people of a lot of learning. And now the Prophet ﷺ was an ummi, which means doesn't read and doesn't write. Allah says, You were not reading any books before this. And you didn't write this with your hand because you don't know how to write. That's what the, the Prophet, the claim about the Prophet is. He's being told to go debate with them. Why? How could that be possible? This is actually the second episode where this is being done with the Israelites. The first episode that this was being done was with Jesus, with Isa alayhi salam. And with Isa alayhi salam, 
he went to the Israelite scholars and he would quote the Torah to them. Because Allah taught Isa alayhi salam the Torah and the Injil. And he didn't go to their schools to learn it. Allah revealed it over again to him. So you can think of it as Torah was revealed to Musa alayhi salam and it was revealed again to Isa alayhi salam. So it, the, the original Torah, because it was changed so many times through history, so Jesus had it again. So he would quote them the Torah better than they knew after all of their scholarship. And we know in the Quran, we have something about Jesus that's not even in the biblical literature. Like he started speaking from the day he was born. So now not, not just, this is Ummi, meaning edu unlettered as if they came out of their child. He was literally Ummi, like he just came out of his Ulf and he was already speaking to them, you understand? So this is a, a repeat of something that has happened before, but the Prophet ﷺ is being told to challenge them with this divine knowledge. This also tells us something else about the nature of, of, of our religion. If you know your book, if you know the scripture that Allah has revealed, the Quran, then you don't have to be intimidated by the qualifications of someone that I can't talk to them about this because they have way too much you know, too many degrees that I can't challenge. Because sometimes you'll find in a debate or a discussion, somebody might say, oh yeah, what degree do you have? What qualifications do you have? And qualifications are about how many books have you read, right? How many classes and courses have you taken? You know, how many, how many, uh, uh, you know, courses of education have you completed from one degree to another, to another, to another, which is all about knowledge, right? That's all, the more degrees you have, the more knowledge you have. But the Qur'an, interestingly, the Qur'an didn't emphasize knowledge as much as it emphasized thinking. So the Qur'an keeps saying, it doesn't c c constantly say, أَفَلَا تَعْلَمُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْلَمُونَ Don't you then know? It says, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Don't you then think? Don't you then... So what's the difference between knowing and thinking? So I'll give you a quick example of this because this also goes back to Al-Kitab wal Hikmah. It goes back to that concept. And that is that you know, everybody can watch the news. Everybody can watch the news. They can say, oh, this war started. Or the price went up. For, for gasoline, the price went up. Or, you know, food prices went up or whatever. Anybody can see that. But there are some people who can see that and they know that that means that there, there's, a, there's a ripple effect of this bit of news and behind it, there's an entire story. And after it, there's an entire story. And they can think through that. It's not just a bit of information, but they can analyze that information. Right? You can study history, but you can, in studying history, you can see this nation came, this empire came, that this empire came, that this empire came. But if somebody studies the philosophy of history, you know what they study? How do nations rise and how do nations fall? What, like they study the formula behind it, right? That's actually thinking. That's not just the information. Because, you know, even in school, sometimes you had to take a test, you had to memorize a bunch of information. And then when the test came, you just have to write the information that you memorized. So you had the knowledge, but you didn't have the thought, the thought process behind it, right? And by the way, some of the most boring subjects when you were younger are subjects like history, right? Literature. These are the boring subjects. I don't have to know all this. What's the point of it? Right? And then as you become older and wiser, you'll realize that those are some of the most important things that develop a person's understanding, right? Because then aql is being applied. What the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us is that it's not the degrees that make an intellectual. Actually, it's thinking that makes an intellectual. You can have someone in the desert that has never gone to a university who's a bigger intellectual than someone who has 20 degrees. And they've got all this information gathered up. And I'm not saying those people can't be wise. Also, they can be. But I've met plenty of, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I've met, I've met plenty of PhDs that are stupid. And I've met plenty of taxi drivers that dropped out of school in third grade that are very wise. That are extremely intellectual. That's the reality of life, right? So here, You go say to them, the Prophet's being told, go address them. Uh, you know, and then say, say what to them? The, uh, means those from the Jewish community. Ya ayyuhalladhina hadu. The word hadu is interesting because it's a verb. Because it, if it was Ya ayyuhal yahud, and yet yahud is the Jewish term also, right? 
And in some societies, this became a condescending term, but this is rich. There's a history behind the term. We'll look at that history in a second. But the word hadu is a verb. And it was used in Arabic, according to Hamiduddin Farahi, he argues that it was used in Arabic for those who belong to the Jewish community. So it was not a condescending term, it was actually used as a, as a regular term. The verb in its original meaning in Arabic, Hada Yahudu, actually means to make, to, to repent, to make tawbah. Hada Yahudu means to make tawbah. So Ya Yuhal Hadu actually means those who repented in the past also. It doesn't just mean those who are Jewish, but also means those who repented. Hada also means to raja'a, to come back. Those who went back, meaning those who went back to God. Which is actually another meaning of tawbah. Tawbah means to return back to Allah. Is it, doesn't it? So it says, إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ بِالدُّونِ النَّاسِ If you have the assumption that you are in fact close friends and protective friends to Allah as opposed to all other people فَتَمَنَّوَ الْمَوْتِ Then wish for death. إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If in fact you are truthful and solid in your claim. They, these are the words that, this is a rough translation of the ayah. The word hada also means, um, it, you know, the, to, to move gently, to move slowly and gently. Okay, so that's the, one of the side meanings of it. I just gave it to you. But I want to read this to you because this is, this is actually an excerpt from a book called Mufradatun Qur'an, uh, which means terms of the Qur'an, written by a remarkable scholar, uh, Hamiduddin Farahi rahimahullah. He was an Indian scholar. But he had, he had studied, he had traveled across the, the Arab world also. And he um, wrote books in which he specialized in what the Quran is saying and how that compares to the Torah. And he actually mastered Hebrew also. So he knew quite a bit of Hebrew. Uh, and he would comment on words in the Quran that are also found in the Torah and do a comparative analysis of them. One of his most amazing books is Ar-Ra'yu Sahih Fi Majhuwa Dhabi. For those of you that can read Arabic, the correct position in who was to be slaughtered. Was it Ishmael that was to be slaughtered by the dream of Abraham? Or was it Isaac? Was it Ismail or Ishaq? Because Muslims have both opinions in our history. Some Muslims believe it was Ishaq, some Muslims believe it was Ismail. So he wrote a book about why he, he believes it's Ismail alayhi salam. What's really cool about his book is the first argument is uh, the Quran's argument. The second argument is the Torah's argument. Uh, and the third argument is from Jewish scholarship. Not even from Muslim scholarship, from Jewish scholarship. And he shows demonstrably how it is actually uh, Ismail alayhi salam that was supposed to be the one to be slaughtered. He proves it from all three and then comes to that conclusion. But he, very unique uh, kind of writer. Anyway, so he talked about, about the word hadu because it has that uh, that biblical uh, connotation. He says, Hada yahudu hawdan taba wa raja'a. This word means to, to repent and to go back. Hikayatan uh, an dua Musa alayhi salam. This is also used in that way in the dua of Musa alayhi salam, which is in the Quran. Waktub lana fi hadhi dunya hasana wa fi al I actually read this to you from Surah Al Araf. A guarantee for us good in this life and in the next life. Inna hudna ilayka. Inna hudna ilayka from Yahudu or Hada Yahudu is actually we come back to you, meaning we repent to you. So the word is used in the meaning of repentance. Waqalu. Uh, and Hada also means for someone to be Jewish, to actually be Jewish, and that's it's also used in that way. For example, So the word Tahawada, for those of you that are know a little bit of Arabic morphology, Sarf, Tahawada, Tanassara. So Nasrani means Christian, Tanassara means to become Christian or to be Christian, Tahawada means to be Jewish. So, كَمَا يُقَالْ تَنَصَّرَ بِنَ النَّصْرَانِيَةِ وَزَعَمَ الطَّاعِنُونَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ أَنَّ هَذِهِ الْكَلِمَةِ خَطَأ And some critics believe that this, mis this word is a mistake in the Qur'an. فَإِنَّ إِسْمَ الْيَهُودِ لَيْسَ مَعْفُوذًا مِنْ مَادَّةِ حَوْدْ بَلْ هُوَ النِّسْبَةِ إِلَى يَهُودًا So, he says, some people think this is a mistake in the Qur'an because the word uh, Jewish or the word Yahudi or Yahada is not about returning or repenting. It actually originally has to do with Judea or Judas or Judah, actually Judah, who is the fourth son of Jacob in the Bible. So Jacob has 12 sons and the fourth son, his name is Yehuda, actually Yehuda. And that's in, in English or in you know, Latinized, it becomes Judah. Okay. And later on, I'll, instead of reading it, I'll summarize this for you. Later on, the, the Jewish empire, from his children, by the way, from the children of Judah, from Yaqub uh, eventually came Daud 
and from Dawud Islam came Sulaiman Islam. And Dawud Islam had a massive empire, and so did Sulaiman Islam. And that empire was called Judah, or Judea actually, Yehuda. So it was named after their forefather, which is the son of Yaqub. Eventually, the Israelites, uh, they started fighting with each other. The, they were the believers of that time, the Muslims of that time, they started fighting with each other and they broke that one nation into two nations much after uh, uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam. They broke it up into two nations called Judea and Israel. So they're called Judea and Israel. And eventually, even those nations fell apart, others came uh, and, and you know uh, uh, invaded them. And when they invaded them, uh, actually, let me read that part for you here. Did I put it here? No, I didn't. Oh, here it is. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّ يَهُودَ كَانَ إِبْنَ الرَّابِعَ عَنْ يَعْقُوبَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ سَيُشْنُ يَهُودَ with a ذَال يَهُودَ was the fourth son of Yaqub وَكَانَ دَعُودَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ مِنْ هَذَا السِّبْ دَعُودَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ was from this lineage فَصَارِ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ فَرِقَيْنِ يَهُودَ عَلَى جَالِبْ وَبَقِيَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ عَلَى آخَرْ um, بقية بني إسرائيل على آخر ثم بعدها سباهم الكالدانيون the, Chalde, the Chaldeans they call them you can look them up on Wikipedia it was a Chaldean empire they came and they kind of destroyed the Jewish empire and they broke it up and now they saw all the Jews uh, they didn't used to get called Jews before the, the, the Judeans were the people that lived in the kingdom of Judea or the descendants of Judah you understand but the enemy came and they just started calling all of the Israelites Yehudi and they didn't say Yahudi with a dal, they said a Yahudi with a dal. So they, they changed it. And so it, it started that way, it, this just became the new word for them. But it goes back to the fourth son of Yaqub alayhi salam, or historically you can say it refers to the time where their empire started disintegrating. The, the, the Jewish empire started disintegrating and that's when this name became the common name. Now there's another interesting thing about this, this name. The Bible has the story of the Yaqub and his family. Like, you know, we have Surah Yusuf in the Quran. So the Bible has the story of Yaqub and his wife and each one of his wives, like Leah and Rachel. And, you know, he had two wives and two servants and he had children with all of them. And one of those, the Rachel, Rachel's children are Joseph and Benjamin, who we call what? Yusuf and Benjamin. But the other children, with the way they have the story is that every time a child was born, the mother, in this case, Leah, made a prayer. Right? Oh, this is a mercy from God, or God has granted this child, and, and, and things like that. And so she turns back to Allah and makes dua, and she, when Judah was born, and she said the, the Hebrew version of Yehuda, and that's why she named him that, and which actually has similar meaning to coming back to God, as a, as a show of gratitude to God. So what Allah does in the Quran, when he says, Ya Ayyuhal Madhina Hadu, he's actually He's taking two, he's killing two birds with one stone. One, it's referring to their empire name and their civilizational name. And it's also referring to the idea that they came, they were supposed to come back to Allah. And that's where the name's blessing came from. So that's how the Quran has employed this name. Okay, anyway. So in Za'amtum, then there's the word Za'am. And this is an important word to understand in the Quran. Za'am, uh, Biz'ama means a snake, a serpent. Taza'um uh, means a lie. Uh, this, this is, uh, let me explain this to you, animals, sometimes when they buy an animal, they check if it's muscular or if it's got good fat, depending on what they're going to do with it. If they're going to load a lot of burdens on it, they want to see if it's muscular. If they're hungry, they're going to check if it's fat, right? Because they want to enjoy the fatty meat, right? So when they check the animal like that, you guys, some of you think you're experts in fruits. So you, when you pick up a fruit from the store, you kind of like... You check, so you check the watermelon, you know, like, you, you, you listen to the soul of the watermelon and then you... <laughs> uh, which is, you know, some people have this like, mashallah, they have this, this they, they believe they have knowledge of the unseen when they pick a cantaloupe or a watermelon, but <laughs> they look like they know what they're doing. Like, you see, some people really take this seriously, you know, put that tomato down, it's red though. Yeah, but that one, you see that, I, they're both red. <laughs> so, so, but th this this is also called zarum. Zarum is the animal that you feel the, the flesh on. Uh, roasted greasy meat is called shawat uh, uzan. You know the 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 first the, the 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 land that starts growing a lot of crop all of a sudden, right? That's called azamatid of the wuzaim. Armor that covers the body zaman. Lots of different meanings from this word. But here's the bottom line: 
لذا قالوا إن الزعم أكثر ما يقال فيما يشك فيه. This is why the word زعم was used mostly in something that isn't for sure. You're not so sure about it, so you use the word زعم. Like you know, you say, "Hey, are you going to come tomorrow?" I'm pretty sure I'm coming. You got? Are you coming? I'm uh, pretty sure. You, what are you? What are you doing? You're putting a little bit of doubt in whether you're coming or not. ولا يحقق ولا يضرى لعله كذب. And it cannot be verified or known for sure whether it's true or not. Like it, it, you can't be entirely certain. أو uh, باطن. ولا الأزهر عبارة توضح ما خد دلالة التركيب على ما لا يثق به من الكلام. And it, it, it indicates according to al Azhari, this is this is the kind of verb that's used to say when someone's saying something that you cannot fully trust. You cannot fully trust it. Now from this came another word, which is za'im. Za'im. Za'im means someone who gives a guarantee. So it's used in Surah Yusuf, for example, that whoever finds the cup, I'm going to give him the reward of a full camel load of wealth, and I'm guaranteeing it. Ana bihi za'im. I'm giving the guarantee of it. But the guarantor is in, in making people believe that he's going to be able to give something, even though they haven't seen any evidence. Right? So they have to rely on his claim and have confidence in him without evidence. Right? So that becomes a zaim, a guarantor. Right? So sometimes, for example, when you're signing papers or you're signing like an apartment rent lease agreement, or you're you're, you're leasing a car or something like that, they make you fill out all kinds of paperwork. Right? Your date of birth, your Financial records, your job, how much money you make, how long have you had the job, what's your shoe size, what you you know, what's, what's your favorite color, all of it. They make you fill that out, right? What's your blood type in case we need to drain your blood to make the payment, etc., etc. But they don't have a guarantee that you're going to pay, but they have to make their best guess based on your job history, your financial situation. Right? Have you made payments in the past or not? And then they basically use that as the closest thing to a guarantee. So they do zaum, right? And you're you're basically giving them a guarantee that you're going to make the payments based on this. So you become a zaim. You understand? So the verb being used, if you are so sure, is actually, are you so confident? But I can tell you're not that confident because if they were absolutely confident about what they're saying, then the word zaum wouldn't be used. You understand? So if you actually think this, and I know that you don't totally think this, then as opposed to other people, فتمنى البوت. Now before I read some hadith to you, we need to understand the challenge in this ayah. Look, I I don't try to, I don't just try to read the mufassirun and then tell you what they said. When I study the Quran, my first process is Allah is talking to me, not to any of you. It's talking to me. Right now, he's just Allah is directly speaking with me as a, as a slave of Allah who received uh, ha- by whatever means received this final revelation. We got it from those who believe before us to those before us to those before us, and now I'm hearing these words. What am I supposed to think about this ayah? Right. So my first question that comes is, well, the ayah says, if you are actually friends with Allah, then you should wish for what? Death. So then my question becomes, well, if I want to be friends with Allah, should I wish for death? Logical question, right? Is that is that what the Quran wants? If because it's saying if you really are, then you should wish for that. So we need to address that question. First and foremost, that I I misrepresented what Allah said on purpose, so you understand the problem with that kind of thinking. The ayah doesn't say if you're actually friends with Allah, then wish for that. It says if you think you're act, if you're so confident that you're the real friends of Allah. As opposed to everyone else on earth, min dunin nas. That's a disclaimer, isn't it? That's an additional qualification. So it doesn't just say, "Oh, if you're if you're close to Allah, you should want to die." No, if you're close to Allah and you're so confident that you're the only one close to Allah and everybody else is not, then you know what? You should even be closer to Allah. Because right? if you're that close, then get even closer. You know, because nobody else is. So that's that's one dent in that argument. But the other is let's take a step back and understand how Islam wants me to think about death. Should I be wishing for death? Should I actually be asking for death? You know, like sometimes we have these more Islamic than Islam type uh, discussions where people say things like we love the akhirah more than we love this dunya. Wallahi, this dunya is nothing. This dunya is nothing. 
There is not even a, a tissue, a used tissue. It is, you know, it will go away. This, you know, the, the, and then so much nothing, nothing, nothing. And I'm like, if somebody came to you and you said, your parents are nothing, you'd get upset because they are something. Somebody came to you and said, the Quran that Allah revealed to us in this dunya is nothing. You would have a problem with that. And if somebody told you, if somebody says, this tree is nothing and that mountain is nothing. Well, Allah says, go look at the tree. And he says, go look at the mountain and find an ayah in it. And an ayah is something of value. But how are you telling me the tree and the mountain is nothing? How are you going to tell me? Allah says the winds are something. Allah says the clouds are something. They have value. Allah says the sea is something, doesn't he? Doesn't he say that? And if it's all nothing, by the way, if I do nothing for you, then you don't have to say thank you. Because I did what? Nothing. But if I did something for you, then at least the courtesy is what? Thanks. Allah does so much for us, and He talks about it in the Quran, and then as a result, what should we do? We cannot thank Him for something that has no value. Is that true? So first, the, the first is this dunya is nothing. Hold on, let's put that in perspective. This dunya is nothing compared to the Asira. Of course, this planet is nothing compared to the rest of the universe in size. Jannah is the size of seven heavens and the earth combined. So clearly, the Akhirah is way bigger than this dunya and by comparison, it is nothing. But right now we are here and this is something. And this is so important that Allah decided that throughout this, through up, up this from the seven heavens, He decided to speak to us on this earth. You know what that means? This is something. And you know what? You're, if you're nothing, if you're so insignificant, why would Allah tell all the angels that have ever existed, I have created this creation that, that demands a sajda should be done over what I have done? Like, why would all the angels do sajda at the amazing creation of the human being if we're nothing? If this life is nothing? And He didn't just say, oh, do sajda to the, you know, uh, to the ruh or because of the ruh. No. He said, I'm going to make him from clay, dirt, which is earth. And then I'm going to put my ruh in him. And then you will do sajda. He described the entire process before we were told to do sajda. So, you know, sometimes we say these things and they sound like really cool slogans. And then you forward them to people when you see these YouTube shorts. This good year is nothing. Hey, I want to forward this to all my friends because I'm really depressed. And I just want everyone else to feel like dunya is nothing. Yes, in comparison to the Akhirah, The things you enjoy in this life as opposed to the Akhirah are nothing but very little. So that's one. The second is, I just, I just want to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to live in this world. I just want to go to, okay, hey, let's talk to you a little bit. Let's have a conversation with you. Man ahabba, there's a hadith of the Prophet Okay. Man ahabba liqa Allahi, ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. Whoever loves to meet with Allah, Allah would love to meet with them. Okay? When when Kari had Yaqa Allah, Kari Allahu Yaqa'ahu. And whoever doesn't want to meet with Allah, Allah doesn't want to meet with that. Now you would think meeting with Allah means what? Death. So if you don't love dying, then Allah doesn't love you. And if you hate dying, then Allah doesn't want to meet you. Okay, that that would you might take that. Qalat Aisha Ubadu Azwajihi in the Nakrahul Mot, Aisha Rabbiallahu anha, and some of the his other spouses also said, We hate death. What? Wait, you're supposed to be Islamic. Oh, they said that. This is not what this means. However, when a believer, when death comes to a believer, when death comes to a believer, he is given the good news that Allah is happy with him and he's about to be honored. This is mentioned in Surah Fusilat. When a person is dying, angels show up before you. You're dying. They're di you haven't died yet. You're dying. And the angels have already started showing up in the, in the hospital bed. You're in bed. People around you are crying. And you can't move your face anymore. You can't show them with your eyes. But angels are starting to show up and saying, Congratulations, you made it, sir. You did good. Congratulations, Jannah is coming for you. We were, by the way, we were your security guards in this life. And we're going to be escorting you into the Asira. 
and you will have everything you ever wanted. Everybody around you is crying and you're like, <laughs> you know what? This person acted like one day they will love to meet with Allah. And when the time comes, Allah is now welcoming them as if he loves to meet with them. Okay. فَلَيْسَ شَيْءٌ شَيْءٌ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا أَبَعْبَهُ uh, so that at that time there will be nothing more beloved to that person except for what is in front of them so they will at that time love meeting with Allah and Allah will love to meet with them and the disbeliever when they when death is presented to them they will be given the good news of Allah's punishment and the outcome of their actions there's nothing more hated to that person it, more more than what they see in front of them. Kariha liqa Allah. He, this person hated the meet, meeting with Allah. Wa kariha Allahu liqa'ahu. They hated, uh, Allah hated meeting with them. Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. Wa man kariha liqa Allah, kariha Allahu liqa'ahu. Faqala, fa'ataytu Aisha. This is another narration, same one. The one who loves meeting with Allah, Allah loves meeting with them. The one who hates meeting with Allah, Allah hates meeting with them. The Sahabi says, I came to Aisha radiallahu anha. فقلت يا أم المؤمنين I said mother of the believers سمعت أبا هريرة يذكر عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حديثا I heard Abu Huraira mention this hadith from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم إن كان كذلك if it is like that فقد حلقنا then we're dead if that is the case then I mean that means we should all die it's such a depressing hadith that's what he said to who I shall be loud قالت إن الحالك من حلق if if that is a hadith it was, he, he didn't say the hadith, he just said, I heard something from Abu Huraira, if it's true, we're all dead. And she said, well, if the Prophet said you're dead, then you're dead. But what did he say? So she said, What did he say actually? She was curious now. Tell me what he said. He, she, he, the person then told her, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever loves to meet with Allah, Allah loves to meet with them. Man kariha liqa Allah, uh, kariha Allahu liqa'ahu. Whoever hated meeting with Allah, Allah does not like to meet with them. And then she says, وَلَيْسَ مِنَّا Or he said, وَلَيْسَ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ إِلَّا هُوَ وَهُوَ يَكْرَهُ الْمَوْتِ And there's not one of us who doesn't hate death. Who likes death? فَقَالَتْ So she said, By the way, the one who's saying, I can't think of anyone who loves to die. Who wants to die? Everybody hates death. Is he not a Sahabi? Is he not a Sahabi? He's a Sahabi, right? He's not a Sahabi that's going to make a YouTube reel about we should love death more than we love life. Have you met this? That Sahabi, if you watch that YouTube video, you're like, well, you need to have a conversation with Aisha, bro. Would be like, so قال it. But قال هو رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Aisha confirmed. That's exactly what the Prophet said. So she had heard this before. So she told him, you're right, that is what the Prophet said. And it is not what you are going towards, meaning you're, go you're taking this in the wrong direction. And she says, Wait. When the fingers stop moving, when the eyes are petrified, when the heart, when the chest is humble, when the skin, the hair rises, meaning death comes. The moment of death. And at that moment, whoever would love to meet with Allah, Allah would love to meet with them. This hadith is about the moment of your death, not the rest of your life. Now, another narration of the Prophet ﷺ. None of you should wish for death. None of you should wish for death. But we have to understand that the ayah just said, if you are friends to Allah, then what? Wish for death. And now the hadith is saying clearly, none of you should wish for death. We've, we've got to reconcile this. Right? We've, we've got to figure this out. Okay. If it's a good person, if they live longer, then they will do more good deeds. And if they're not a good person, then maybe they'll make tawbah. So they shouldn't wish for what? Death. Allah is keeping air going into my lungs. He's allowing me to inhale and exhale. Allah is allowing my heart to pump blood throughout my body because He, in His wisdom, the one who owns everything in His wisdom, you, you, you mean, decides when I will live, decides when I will die. 
he decided, I still have an opportunity to do more good deeds, and I still have an opportunity to repent. It is not time for me to leave yet. When there's no purpose left for me on this earth, in Allah's plan, I will die. When there's no purpose left. And that purpose of mine, how long will I live? What good will I serve? How much opportunity of good will I have? That wasn't decided by me. That was decided by Allah Azza wa this, this, is, this is in the hands of Allah. So nobody should be wishing for that. Something that is decreed, you, ye, what do you mean? He gives life, he gives death. He gives life and he gives death. Okay, so now, uh, all right. Let's now understand this ayah again. And before we do, a, a couple other statements about death. Two about death and two about life. We make a dua in the Quran, Abu Yusuf made this dua, Tawaffadi Musliman wa alhikni bis salihin. Ya Allah, when you give me death, give me death as a Muslim. Take me as a Muslim and join me in the company of good people. That's the words of Yusuf. We make dua in Surah Al Ibran, Tawaffana ma al abrar. Give, take us among good people. Take us among the good people. So these are duas for what? Death. But they're not for death right now. You know what these duas are? When the time of death comes, Ya Allah, allow me to be in a state of Islam and allow me to join the people that are good. When that time comes. La, you saw Allah says, Ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa anta muslimu. Don't you dare die except you're in surrender. Would you dare let death come to you except you're in surrender? This is not wishing for death. This is preparing for death. Those are two separate things. So that's the that's the, the, the goal. The point of my statement so far is this. The believer does not wish for death, but the believer prepares for death. The believer is ready for death, even if they're not wishing for it. I have to live my life in a way that if Allah took me today, I should be able to say to Allah, Ya Allah, today I made Tawbah. Before you took me, I made Tawbah. And I did whatever good I could. And I was trying to get away from as much bad as I could. I have to live my life ready for death, not wishing for death. You understand the point? Now, if Akhirah is everything and dunya is nothing, the biggest convention of the year where you realize dunya is nothing is Hajj. Why? Because you go to Hajj, you wear clothes like it's judgment day already. You know that, right? I know the billionaire and the homeless person, the taxi driver and the owner of the taxi company, all wearing the same clothes. All lined up, same way. And we're, we're standing in millions in front of Allah, in the front of his house saying, here we come Allah, here we are, here we are, we answer your call. By the way, this is a, it's called a dress rehearsal. It's a rehearsal for which day? for Judgment Day, when we're gonna come before Allah. That's what this is. So this is, if there's one time where you should forget about the dunya, and you should only think about the akhirah, it should be when? Hajj. We do tawaf. And as we're doing tawaf, we come to the, the stone and we say, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab al nar. Ya, our master, give us the good in this life and good in the next life and protect us from the punishment of the fire. If this is the time to forget all of dunya, what should you be asking? Ya Allah, give us akhirah. I don't care about dunya, it's nothing. Just let me die, let me die here. Please, Ya Allah, let me just die here. Some people have seen that. When I went to high school, Ya Allah, just let me die here. I was like, a psycho? <laughs> what? Why are you saying? You just said, Rabbana atira fi dunya hasana. Fi akhirati hasana. But there is, see this, what happens is people are depressed. People have some hopeless situation in their lives. People have some other problem going on. They owe a lot of people money. Some other situation. And they're like, Ya Allah, just take me. You know? <laughs> but that's not a spiritual situation. That's a psychological situation or a financial situation or a social situation. And you like to feel better about yourself and lie to yourself and tell yourself this is your spiritual situation. It's not. You're lying. Stop kidding yourself. You know? There are some people that like to be dramatic like that. Ya Allah, I wish I was dead before this happened. Oh. Yeah, it's a lot easier to just... <laughs> it's 
So unnecessary drama. And it, this is playing with something that Allah has Himself given. Now look at this. If Allah did not extend somebody's life, then somebody gets to the point where they're 40 years old. The Quran marks 40 years old as a pivotal moment in a person's life. There's, it's the midpoint of their, their youth has ended and the older age, the adulthood into old age is going to begin. So it's the halfway, it's the, it's the half time in the, in the match, right? That's 40 on average. So Allah says, at that time, what dua should you make? Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya wa ala walidayya. My master, empower me to be grateful for the favors you've already done for me. And the favors you have done to my parents. Isn't that you acknowledging that life has been good? Because how can you say, Ya Allah, enable me to be grateful for all the blessings you gave me and all the blessings you gave to my parents if there's nothing good in life? If you should only be wishing for death, then this dua would have no meaning. You understand? And then you say, Wa ada amala salihan tardahu. Ya Allah, allow me to do good deeds that will make you happy. Is that a dua for now or also the future? That's also the future. Now you're making dua to have an opportunity to do good, do good deeds in the future. What I'm saying is, guys, that, you know, as we as I study the Quran, I realize, I try to analyze what I hear about Islam from the, from the khutbah, what I hear about Islam from people, you know, and I see, I realize we use a lot of slogans, we use a lot of catchphrases that aren't actually, they're against Allah's book, but they become very common, you know. We want death more than we want life? Who said? Who said? He put everything in the earth for, for you all together. Now, let's take another stab at this and understand this properly. The Quran does not give the same kind of reminder in every situation. If you are, if I am, let, not, let me not talk about you, let me talk about me. If I am just having way too much fun, Way too much, like, money is good, entertainment is good, family, everything's set, everything's cruising, right? It's easy for me to forget that this life is temporary. Maybe at that time, a good reminder for me is I should be prepared for death. And I shouldn't just associate this as my goal. The light journey is a lot longer. I get, you can get distracted easily. Allah says it. When you have a lot of good things, they, they, they distract. And then you end up basically you end up pretty much at the time of death and you didn't even realize you were just distracted. You know, you went from one PlayStation game to the next game to the next game, one Netflix series to the next series to the next series, and now death is here. So maybe it's a good thing for you to step back and remember death a little bit in that situation. You understand? But if you're going through a hard time, if you're going through a hard time, like when difficulty comes, there's a lesson, it's okay. Difficulty may be there, but you're gonna die, so it's okay. You just wish for death. No, then you should have hope that things will get better where? In this life, in the al Rusli. Isn't that the opposite? There's a balance in this religion that if you're becoming too material, then maybe you should step back from the material a little bit and remember death. And if you're becoming too gloomy about life, or you're like, oh, death would be better then maybe you should just shut that part of your brain up and don't listen to that hopeless waswasa and turn the other way and say, no, ease will come from Allah. Allah's help will come. You know, so this this is a this is a balance in the Quran. It's not one, one size fits all. My, my life, my emotions, they're not always the same. I go through different things in life. And at different points, there are different reminders in the Quran that come in 